Okay. So, hi, Sammy. Hi, Corey. <laughs> welcome, welcome back for our next topic. We're uh, uh, and welcome back everybody who's watching to Poly Topics. We're going to be talking about supporting our partners in their relationships. So uh, this is a pretty big topic, and like last time, um, we've had a lot to say, and um, we're going to have a fair bit to share and some insights, and maybe you'll learn something, maybe we'll learn something as we're talking. Um, but uh, we're going we're gonna to cover the whole notion of how do you support your partner when they're in a relationship or if they're in a new relationship or they're in a struggling relationship and how do you navigate what that looks like um how how can how can you improve that that support because we're in poly relationships and we want to have um healthy dynamics with our partners and mm -hmm. we want our partners to be healthy too uh and their relationships so um and with so, that too there's always like a little ick that comes in between that and adjustments mm -hmm. and um so it's important to figure out how we can manage that how we can go to a healthier mindset and how we can honor that so, yeah yeah so that'll be fun so uh Sam, sammy's got a, a different uh setup today she's on her laptop she looks quite glowing and beautiful <laughs> and, uh, she's a natural light and she sounds good um it turns out we last time we did this we had gray sweaters we weren't planning on it but we both have purple on today. yeah we have purple on today so <laughs> it wasn't again it wasn't planned so that's pretty so, so next topic uh, maybe we'll match again unknown maybe we'll, we'll see <laughs> we won't collaborate on that so all right so uh just to sort of give you a uh sort of a highlights of what we're going to talk about today um we're first going to talk about um the structuring of your relationship what kind of structures are available and those structure how those structures uh, fit into the supporting your uh partners and your relationships in, the, in that respect um and then we're actually going to talk about new relationships when they come into play when your partner brings a relationship in um also supporting new partnerships because our one of our, our other topics was relationships and partnerships relationships are different than partnerships so there's some special considerations or different considerations when you have a partnership that um is coming into the mix rather than just a relationship of some sort also we're going to be talking about communication and communicate, communicating within your relationship while they're uh, do, dealing with their other, their other um, connections. Uh, we're also going to talk about boundaries and what to do when people break the boundaries, that sort of thing, how to handle them. We're going to talk about jealousy, envy, compersion, those sorts of interesting those interesting things, as well as respecting your meta, which we'll get into what the meta is if you don't know. And then also we'll sort of wrap up with about honoring yourself in that whole process of supporting your partner's relationship. So so that's really the the topics we're gonna <laughs> cover today. Uh, anything you wanna say before we, we begin with our uh, our relationship structures? Uh, no, um, except for I guess with the beginning of the relationship structures, um, mm -hmm. we are probably only going to highlight a few. There, there is so many different structures, and how everyone poly uh, or experiences on uh, ethical non-monogamy is different. If we do not mention a structure that you are familiar with, that you've experienced or are experiencing. Um, please let us know so that maybe in another discussion that we can talk about that. I'm sure that we are going to have a discussion all about structure completely on its own one day because um, there's so much to cover there and it's so amazing. And I'm actually so intrigued by the way people have their relationships or partnerships with different structures. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and having said that, if uh, you're new to the channel, um, you should definitely hit that uh, like button so you can help the algorithm move us in the proper direction. 
which is to get this the content out more and also hit the subscribe button below um because we're new and we need subscribers to, to keep uh notifying you of content so yeah so that's my that's our <laughs> our, our sales pitch <laughs> our sales pitch, yeah. our sales pitch <laughs> for the channel otherwise uh um you know we'll just uh we'll start off um yeah as you were saying the relationship structures um i don't think there's there's a few that we wanted to talk about there's some configurations we won't be talking about uh i think these triads and quads and the sort of polycules in general uh i don't think we'll be covering that much uh would that be that be fair to say i would say that is fair to say um i feel like what to generalize what we are speaking about um will cover parts of those those dynamics uh relationships and partnerships of the quads or triads and stuff um yeah. so we have actually i see if i'll maybe i'll do it this way no i'll do it this way <laughs> Do the live thing. Um, we've got an article by Stephanie Sullivan. I'm not really familiar with her. I did have an opportunity to look at this a bit, and she talks about uh, the different relationship structures. But we're actually going to talk about hierarchical uh, polyamory, non-hierarchical polyamory solo, and relationship anarchy. So what are these things? And why is knowing your relationship structure important to supporting your partnerships? Um, so I'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll cover what these are first, and then we'll go back and ex sort of talk about why we think that knowing these are important. So I'll just read off from the, from the uh, article here. So in hierarchical polyamory individuals who practice hierarchical polyamory place more importance on one relationship above other relationships the partner that this person shares finances with lives with or co-parents with will likely be considered the primary partner this person may be prioritized above other relationships in regards to time commitments vacations and holidays going to family functions other important events as well other partners may be considered secondary or tertiary Secondary or tertiary partners may not be taken into account when big decisions are being made. And if the individual is not out as polyamorous, could even be kept hidden from family and friends. So that's, that's hierarchical. Now, non-hierarchical polyamory, make sure I get that highlighted. Uh, individuals within the relationship do not prioritize one relationship above all others. This does not necessarily mean that time is split equally between two or more partners, nor does it mean that all the partners live together. It does mean that every partner is considered when making big decisions. It may also mean that each partner has the ability to go on vacations with the individual. Within non-hierarchical polyamory, there is generally a belief that one partner does not hold importance over another, and each relationship is important in its own way. And now with solely, so, solely, <laughs> solely <laughs> poly, yeah, um, solo poly, Amory, also referred to as SOPO. I've not heard that before. Um, a solo polyamorist is someone who does not have any desire to be considered part of a coupled relationship. In solo polyamory, an individual may not live with or share finances with anyone else and does not have the desire to work towards those things. Some solo polyamorous may live with different partners throughout the year and prefer a nomadic lifestyle. They, also, they often consider their partners when making big decisions, but do not allow their partners to dictate their choices. For some people, solo polyamory is an option to pursue for a limited time, perhaps while raising their children or when an individual is focused on their career and has no desire to build a home with another person. For others, solo polyamory is a lifelong pursuit and often consider themselves their own primary relationship. Hmm. This can also, or this can allow the solo polyamorous to make decisions based on what makes themselves and their relationship strong and happy. Although solo polyamorous usually do not live with their partners, this does not mean that they do not have one or more deeply committed uh, and intimate relationships. Well, I have to say I'm doing pretty good about reading off the screen. <laughs> 
I, uh, I thought I would <laughs> I thought I would trip up more than I did, so that's actually okay. All right, and so finally, the last one what we'll sort of define here is the relationship anarchy. A person who pr practices relationship anarchy may differ a bit from other polyamorous, but they still often fall within the spectrum of polyamory. Relationship anarchy is a relatively new term to refer to individuals who believe that all interpersonal relationships are equally important. A relationship anarchist might have multiple romantic relationships simultaneously, but may also avoid making special distinctions between relationships that are romantic, sexual, platonic, or familial. They often avoid putting relationships into categories and having expectations in their relationships. Instead, they allow their relationships to take any form and have any level of commitment that the participants decide to have. For example, a relationship anarchist may choose to buy a house with their best friend rather than the romantic partner of 10 years. So, so those sort of, that's not, a, 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 the, article, the article says here, again, this is not an exhaustive uh, list by any means. Yes. And no, it's not. Um, and the, the point that I try to bring these up is that when you are in a poly relationship, you should know sort of how it's structured. If you're just flying by the seat of your pants, it can get challenging when you're trying to navigate your relation. So you might be out uh, having other, you might have other relationships with other people, but your partner may not just yet. And then what happens when they do? So you kind of have to know how you are willing to sort of structure it. Now, some, as I said, a relationship anarchy sort of lends to itself to no structure, which I think is okay. Uh, for some people, uh, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with any of those things. I know for myself, I probably practice sort of somewhere in the middle of non-hierarchical poly and hierarchical poly. I know we've talked about hierarchical poly in the context of function. Yeah. So more hierarchical from a partnership standpoint, but not hierarchical from a relationship standpoint. So that's sort of where I fit into that. And so the choices I make with supporting my partner and how I go about that uh, are directly connected there. So basically you're saying that as far as like a partnership and your agreements that you made to um, share these life things with um, is different from your emotional side. So you don't have an emotional hierarchy. No, I don't, I don't, I don't impose a hierarchy. I think, I think uh, relationships uh, live and die. I think I've said this before, live and die by their own merits. And mm -hmm. you have uh, varying degrees of connection with people and connections take time. Yeah. So yeah. Um, how you see your relationships evolve changes mm -hmm. from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. Some people are very comfortable with having a strict hierarchy emotionally and uh, I guess functionally or as a partnership. So um, for me, I always felt a little constraining, I think, especially on the emotional side. Um, I think there was, there's another term that uh, was fluid, fluid poly. Yeah. And not, that's not, not to be confused with fluid <laughs> bonding, <Yeah. laughs> which is a different topic entirely. We won't get into that. But I think, I don't think it fits under the anarchy. It probably fits into the non hierarchical where re mm -hmm. relationships are their own thing. Yeah. So, they, and uh, they are able to adjust within that relationship. So you might have a partnership with that fluid and it may turn into a relationship where now you don't share. Uh, set things or it may be a relationship that it, it turns into a partnership or it may just go back to a friendship where there's no romantic intimacy, whatever, but that this person is of value in your life and you, you still value them for who they are and you still want them in your life. And it's that understanding um, yeah. between two. Um, so those, I'm just trying to think about how Your, you and your partner, I think, have to be cognizant of how that structure sort of plays out on your day-to-day. -day. Because if you have a solo, 
if you are involved with a solo poly partner, how you support them will be different than if you have a live-in hierarchical partner. <laughs> um, the expectations are different. The boundaries are different. The um, agreements are different. So uh, that's just an example. Um, some people are so, like relationship anarchy because it's it has more it, it's highly fluid and very individual the going down that road is different than again being in a, in a hierarchical situation or even in a even in a non hierarchical situation so we have to be we have to know what we're in in order to know what kind of agreements and boundaries and things like that and expectations to have before going in. Because I think that can get tricky if we just sort of, we set expectations in our own heads and we don't actually talk about them. Absolutely. I also feel that you can have a relationship with someone, like let's say you can have a relationship with someone who practices hierarchy. And so that, that hierarchy, they have a primary partner and they view you as a secondary, that's, that's not inherently wrong if you understand that's the structure that you are walking into. You know, you may practice solo poly. So to you, that might be okay. Like, yes, I can enter into this relationship structure with this person who does have a hierarchy, but I need to know the expectations of that hierarchy. So I have to communicate that to have a healthy relationship. Um, and then if all parties agree, right, it's all about agreement yep. and understanding those expectations. Yep. Yeah. And then we'll get into talking a bit about that, um, when we start talking about more about the aspects of actually full on communicating, there's com communications, a common topic, like you know, when you and I were organizing these topics together, we were like, well, where does this fit? Where does that fit? And a lot of these topics <laughs> sort of blend over. So, um, we, we may be talking about this, but not going into any detail until a bit later. Um, totally. So, Sammy, tell me about what you, uh, how is it for you in your, well, let, let's say, what, what is your relationship structure, do you think? Well, I know you've had probably a couple of relationship structures over your um, yeah, over the years. I've, I've had different structures. Um, and I guess it, it goes all different between the individual people, you know, and how you want to re, reframe that. Um, I identified as solo poly for a long while. Um, I didn't have a, a live-in at that time. Um, I went along with the agreements that I set in my relationships, but I did not let um, any agreements go to where it was a a partnership. Um, so it was, I don't, for lack of a better word, it was freeing. Like I, uh -huh. I felt like I could just be completely authentically me. I didn't have, have those agreements or boundaries, um, except for when it came to uh, safe sex practices. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. That was important. Yeah. Um, I believe that I started off in poly with a hierarchy and just did not know it because uh -huh. um, we didn't really discuss it. We didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we were we were just thought, hey, this is what we believe because we believe that we can care and love for more than one person, um, and what that looked like. And we didn't talk about things until they came up, right? Right, and, and I, you sort of. And let me guess, you're sort of, because you're flying by the seat of your pants, all of the, the, the complications unfold. They and sure knowing do. how to, yeah. you don't know how to support your partners yeah. dealing with no. new people coming in or even yourself. <laughs> that matters yeah, sometimes. Yeah. What do you you do? don't know what your own, those emotions are. You've never felt them before. And all of a sudden they're all here. And sometimes it can be life changing. Um, that adaptation, you know, uh, a lot of times society had brought us to this, this escalator of life of what's supposed to be, and that's not what's supposed to be. 
was supposed to be is how, how you define it, how you want your life to be, how you want your relationships to be. That's not saying that you don't want to have a living partner, a nesting partner, a marriage, or something along those lines, but it's how you define those and then how you define those in your relationships or your other relationships or your other partnerships. Um, and then if everyone kind of can kind of agree or get along. Um, so in the beginning, yeah, I had kind of a hierarchy and then it turned into not having a hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I had solo and then I practiced fluid poly for a little while. Um, with a partner that really opened my eyes of what that meant. Um, and it came down to a point where he no longer felt romantic with me, but he still loved me uh, and wanted me in his life. Mm -hmm. um, and so we turned in more to like, it was a friendship, but it felt more than a friendship because there was still a lot of love there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a person I still can go to any day. And they will be like, yes, okay, I see you. I hear you. I know who you are. I love you. What, what, what do you need help with? How can I help you? Um, and there still might be some little kissing there. I don't know. <laughs> no that's, that's the nature of how this goes sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes relationships are a little squishy. A little squishy. Squishy's good. Yep, squishy's good. I like I like squishy gray area uh, stuff yeah. sometimes yeah. because that means that you get aspects of relationship. I don't want to get off too much topic, but you do get the benefits of being able to express yourself in a connection with somebody in a genuine, authentic manner. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. have to, it doesn't have to be all inclusive. Uh it can be it can be um you know snogging partners or cuddle buddies <laughs> or um somebody that comes to sleep over but you don't have sex or you go to yeah, movies yeah, with a movie buddy you know something like that uh or you go on vacations you know it's nice to have that sort of thing that so yeah what's that that companionship yeah yes so, yeah. um where i'm at currently honestly to be 100 percent real mm -hmm. i don't know um my structure with my nesting partner has changed or is changing um he oh when he met me, he was monogamous. Um, or not, I should say monogamous, like not identifying, like he perceived himself as that without realizing, because um, he has told me multiple times, like he never actually felt monogamous. He just wasn't able to freely explore. Um, so my correction on that. Uh, and now that he was really able to explore with me, with a partner, um, our relationship is adjusting. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we have a partnership. We, we share a home together. We pay these finances together. We have a child together. Um, and we have these things together, but as far as structure wise, um, we have to have a lot more communication and we have to sit down and talk about that, um, and where it, it's going. Um, things can get a little complicated and those readjustments have to happen. Um, people have accused of us having a hierarchy and we don't have a subscribed hierarchy as far as our emotions or our intimacy. Um, I don't really feel that one partner uh, is more superior than the other. I feel, or more relationship. I feel it's a difference between relationship and partnership. Um, and that's what I stand. Um, so, so it's, I think it's fair to say that, um, when new people come into the mix, that structures can change potentially. It doesn't mean they always will, but structures yeah. can change. We might, we might go from hierarchical to non-hierarchical, or we might go from, you know, I don't know, like uh, you might, or when new people, when people leave the mix too, I guess. There's that, there's that aspect. So you could be with somebody and then they have another partner or another relationship and that ends and that changes things. So uh, I know when my wife and I had a baby um, uh, in the last few years, uh, our second child, that had an effect on our ability and interest to practice polyamory. Yeah. And so over time that we've readjusted. So we focus more on our family and all the complications that came with that uh, being 
par uh, new parents later in life that we weren't expecting at the time, <laughs> but it happened. So, you know, uh, and, and I think I, I think we maybe, I don't know if we said this before, maybe we talked about this at one point, but like children almost like affect, um, <laughs> affect things they're they're not like part they're not your partners but they act like a partner it's like an illness yeah. acts like a partner you have to manage that yeah. and mm -hmm. those change those dynamics too so um, so so or, uh, this is a good segue into talking about how do we deal with a partner or a relationship that ends up meeting somebody new and because I've been on the end of both. I've, I've met somebody new, but I've also had partners meet somebody new. Um, I can say from my perspective that, so when I meet somebody new, the way I'm feeling is very different than <laughs> how I no generally tend to feel initially with um, my partners meeting somebody new. When some, my partners meet somebody new, and this is sort of where we want to focus our conversation yeah. here. I, if we've known them for a long time, prior to that, that's uh, tends to be a different story. I'm, I'm far more comfortable with them, but if they're brand new, uh, my back gets up, but honestly, it just goes, I go, whoa, wait, wait, whoa, 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 what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? Because I know things are gonna change. Yeah. And um, yeah. I have a certain level of um, safety and security and predictability and order that I like in my life. and. When somebody new comes in, that changes the the partnership that I have with my wife. In this particular case, I'll just use my wife as an example, um, but also changes the relationship I have with my wife in some respects mm -hmm. because um, time is now um, one of those constraints that we have to struggle with. So, and then mm -hmm. we get uh, we get to deal with NRE, that new relationship energy, and all that stuff, and that's. <clears throat> That's a struggle when people don't know how to manage that. When your partner doesn't know how to manage that well, that can be a real big challenge. You just watch people go crazy. <laughs> uh, I've seen <laughs> I've seen that in a few different ways, either myself or in my own life, have, having happened to me or my my partners or other people that I know that are have a new relationships and I watch them. So with the new relationship, flounder, but they just go <laughs> all over the place. So the new relationship energy is basically all the the heightened like happiness and um, glory filled uh, feelings, like all those like this person's the, the greatest person in the whole world, um, and you're getting to know that person, but you also are not getting to know that person at the same time, right? So things that may agitate you with other people at this state of new relationship energy, it may not. Um, you're seeing this person with like this um, light aura around them. Everything is just grand and wonderful and, and, and perfect. And you can talk to this person about anything. You can do anything. There's no stressors in life. And it's like Nick, mm -hmm. it's this escape almost from, from everything. And it feels so good. And that, NRE can last. Some people call it like the honeymoon phase, right? Mm -hmm, so like mm -hmm. when people talk about the honeymoon phase from like a marriage or whatever, you know, that happy glowing. And then all of a sudden here's a big bomb, real life happens, right? And then mm -hmm. that's where you actually find out if the relationships or partnerships are able to subside and, and live through, you know, where their compromises mm -hmm. are and stuff. So I know what I, I've had vari a variety, being new into poly at the time, I know my reaction to NRE is to freak out, <laughs> was to freak out, um, not on my side, but watching, like, when my wife told me she fell in love with somebody, I went, mm -hmm. oh, oh, what does this mean? It's like, there's, there, you just, you, you feel, you feel a gun, a gut punch, or you feel blindsided. Especially mm -hmm. if you had like, well, we're not going to get emotionally involved. And that was pre-poly uh, thinking, right? It's like. <laughs> well, there's just... a lot of people that do that, that they they um, mm -hmm. have more of the swinger mindset of, okay, we can we can be sexual 
we can go on these dates, but don't get emotionally entwined, right? And and that's that's not what Polly is. That's not no you know, no. But that's like you know I, I don't know about for I don't know if this is for every, there's probably people out there that can do this, mm-hmm. but I just know in the relationships that I've had <laughs> to put that kind of constraint on somebody else is not supportive and it's mm-hmm. a losing battle especially if people get connected um you have people form relationships the way they form relationships whether they get close or they're they're sort of you know a loose connection or whatever they're going to do that and they're uh imposing these hard structures of like no you can't do this no you can't <laughs> do that um that i think that makes things difficult and it really especially in the whole nre phase too right because yeah, yeah. you're exploring everything and you you get all those giddy feelings and you do fall you do tend to fall in love the the classic sort of uh electric butterflies and oh i don't eat for two weeks and i lose 20 pounds <laughs> because i'm because i'm doing that and so watching your partner go through that is a bit of a roller coaster so how do we support? So how do we support our partner to, um, going through that that initial? So how do we support our partner who is experiencing NRE? Yeah, what do we okay. do? What's the what's a healthy uh, way? A healthy way is to identify your own emotions. Okay. Um, yourself before before speaking to this partner. This partner is in a a very heightened state, right? A heightened mm-hmm. of happiness. And if we go to our partner with a mix of emotions and not understand what they are, this person, our partner, or or the, our relationship person may come back and be like, you're not happy for me. Like, mm-hmm. I don't feel that, or I don't feel that you're poly because you're not supportive. Oh, I've heard that before too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we really have to work on to identify what our actual emotion is mm-hmm. to be able to communicate that. And it could be, hey, I'm having an insecure feeling and mm-hmm. I kind of feel a little less than um, and going to them and talking to them about this. At a so, do you, as appropriate. so do you think that part of that process of figuring out what you're emo- uh, in, in those moments, especially if it's tough. So there's the there's the easy part. If you've done this before, it's a lot easier. You do this a okay. few times and things go more like butter. It doesn't, it's not always like that, but generally it gets easier because you've seen it before and you know what phases to expect. But um, but I think when you're trying to sort out your emotions, I think this works in general, but uh, sometimes it's hard, especially if you have like trauma responses or mm-hmm. triggers and things like that. And you're like, my partner's behavior is making me feel this way. I think the big challenge, and I think the onus is upon us to know what, I'm going to just say it, to know what's your shit and what's their shit. But you have to figure (laughs) out what's your shit first. You have to know what your, what's on you. And you don't, you don't want to come to your partner when you're trying to support their new adventure with another person and stick all of your emotional baggage onto them as their fault. I think that's that's a that's a that's a really big recipe for disaster. But I think what you said about saying, "Hey, look, I'm ha- I just want to share with you, I'm having these feelings." Ooh, we're yeah. getting the camera moving. <laughs> um, I want to share with you these feelings. Uh, it's important for me to say what those are. Uh, but so, to know what those are is a big deal. Well, so after you, like, if you are having a trauma response from a past relationship, like you need to identify like, hey, I, or you should, I, I shouldn't, I don't like to use the word need. You should identify like, if you realize that I'm having this experience and it feels as though it's from a past experience mm-hmm. and I feel that it's coming up here and I have an insecurity, mm-hmm. like, can you help? relieve this insecurity for me mm-hmm. and then addressing what that means we need for you like maybe it's you need a hug maybe it's you need to cuddle maybe it's you need some space you know maybe it's these little things 
and then um, listening to your your partner or the person you're in a relationship with that mm-hmm. you know they are an NRA they may come back to you and say I can't help you with this like I'm experiencing my joy in in this mm-hmm. relationship and I'm going to continue to do that um, is there somebody else you can go to that's right. So I was just thinking, as you were talking about that, that's the thought that came to my mind because some of our, uh, like our initial reaction is to go to the person where a lot of the emotional energy um, is focused on. So your your partner's in this lovely space and you want to be happy for them, but you're going through all of this stuff. What do you do? So you So how do you sort out your feelings so you can actually have a reasonable conversation with them? Or do you have another outlet? So are you in therapy? Um, Do you have a best friend you can talk to? Would you have a poly mentor or somebody to support Mm -hmm. or like an online group or whatever? You could use uh, um, these resources to help you in some ways vent. But uh, venting doesn't just help relieve the pressure, but talking about stuff helps you organize your thinking better. And then a good, uh, a good, system of doing that will give you honest feedback and they'll say hey i think that this is this is set up in your mind and this is other things that you see so if um if they're if this person's exploring poly for the first time and you're watching them uh you know you know uh go on on like out four nights in the week and you're like going hey uh how do I, like, where'd you go? <laughs> Are you escaping? Like, yeah. you gotta, I'm like, you have, you have to be able to talk about that. There's feelings that you're having about that, but you also have to be able to talk about the behavior, right? Um, so knowing what, what's the, what your partner own, what, what you believe your partner needs, uh, you know, that, what's on them and then what's on you, I think, uh, is good for starting some of those uh, discussions. Um, but does that, are we really talking about, maybe I guess in a way, knowing how to regulate and manage your own emotional state while watching your partner explore a relationship is supporting them in some yeah, way. It is. And it so is. keep that in mind that, you, that, that, that it's important for you to do that. Uh, and I have to say, I, you probably might agree with this, you might not, but I think with the earlier on uh you are in your poly journey the harder usually the harder it is some people are just totally built for it and they don't really have much (laughs) issues but a lot of people will struggle with this and question their choices and question whether or not they're doing the right thing for themselves or for their relationship but um i think it's real i think the knowing your emotional side is really important um, so going to the other part of it, like, how do you handle it when your partner or person of relationship comes to you for support? They're asking you for support. Like, how do you handle that? Like you, your experience in your NRE and mm-hmm. your partner's coming to you with support. Like they, they need your support. Um, what, what do you do? So even okay, so there's a few. Well, there's a few different scenarios. So I was thinking of one scenario, and I think you uh, mentioned another. So there's the um, you uh, are the person that your partner is in a relationship that's having something going on with it, and they need to come to you because you're per- you're a safe person and you're a trusted person, and they want support from you. And so you're going, well, this isn't my relationship with this other person. Why would I get involved? That's sort of the normal. Um, maybe the headspace you might default to initially, but really that person is coming to you as your friend. I know my wife and I have, um, I, well, there's something else I'll, we'll talk about a little bit later in the communicating, but I know my wife will say to me, okay, Corey, I need you as my friend right now. Can I talk to you as my friend? And I went yeah, and I go, okay, so that's what that does is it sets my mind set in that means that she's struggling or she has an issue and she wants to talk it through. Um, after some point, uh, it gets a bit more natural and you might not necessarily do that. But 
by, by signaling that it's like, okay, I, she needs a friend or my partner needs a friend. They need to talk about this or then let's, let's, let's do that. And then that usually is a good way to start a conversation. And then I think the other scenario you had is that, um, that if I need support while my partner is off in NRE land, what do you do? How do you ask for support? And how does a person, if you're in NRE, how do you support your other partner who's needing you? So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that on you. I did the other one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm experiencing NRE and my partner's coming to me um, mm -hmm. for support. Uh, there's going to be times where I'm going to tell my partner that I cannot be their support system. Um, while I'm experiencing this type of, you know, questions that they're asking or that they need from me, um, I'm going to ask them what they actually need. I'm going to ask them, are, what are you looking for? How can I help you? Are you looking for uh, comfort? Are you looking to express? Um, what, what do you actually need? And sometimes that can be very difficult. Um, and then I'm going to have to address, like, I, I can't meet this need for you right now. You know, is there another person that we can give that to? Um, but I'm also going to be considerate of my partner as knowing that they are watching me in this heightened state and that I may need to give them more support, more comfort. Um, maybe it's okay, let's set a time to have discussions or let's set an hour where we're devoted to each other and the TV's off, phones are off or whatever and it, it's a simple hour. Um, or asking them, do we need to restructure things? Um, do you have new boundaries that are coming up? You know, are there agreements that we need to adjust? Um, and the vice versa, like me supporting a partner with NRE um, is, is a lot of owning my own shit mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and coming to them with, with the identifying what I may need. Mm -hmm. um, and also, holding myself accountable when I'm acting like a not so great person and I'm acting out in emotions instead of being able to communicate or walk away. Mm -hmm. And those are important too. So you have to kind of understand your own, your own baggage that you're bringing up to that and your own emotional state. And then you have to say, Hey, yeah, uh, that was a pretty crappy thing that I did. So I'm not going to do that thing. And um, I'm going to apologize and I'm going to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then- You're talking about accountability. Accountability. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Accountability in your, rela your relationship with this other person. Yeah. Uh, whether they're your partner or just a really, uh, your uh, relationship of being accountable about your own yeah. behavior. Yeah. 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 And yeah, so and that's what I, I think when you're watching your your uh, relationship with somebody uh, with your partner or your connection form and they're forming something else with with um, somebody new. Um, shit, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> OK, I'm going to stop that. I'm not going to try to fish for it. Um, yeah. Oh, so, holding grace for somebody too. That's important. Like, like understanding that. Being able to forgive people. Uh, yeah. I mean that too. Like forgive them for the moments, like understanding their intentions versus the impact. Uh -huh. And so the intention may be um, innocent, but the impact is a lot harder. Uh -huh. um, and recognizing what that impact may do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then holding accountability or also saying like, Hey, like, I feel like you're responding in emotion. I love mm -hmm. you. I care for you. Um, but I'm not going to hold 
this guilt over it. Like this is mm-hmm. not my my it's not my shit to work out. I guess. Right. So being whether or not uh, like holding like feeling angry about something and whether or not you're gonna like hold anger over it or say okay, uh, I've already said what I need to say. Let's move forward. I think. Yeah. Tr- I think trying to, in in the in this context supporting your partner's relationships. Um, you have you have to be willing to al- mistakes happen innocent or not sometimes yeah. they're intentional but they're not in a lot of times we uh, i think there's a fine line between how we interpret actions as intentional and meant to hurt us versus they are they were in they were made decisions, but they didn't understand what the impact would be. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, being able to figure that out and be able to discern that, I think is really important. Not um, not necessarily just default to, oh, well, you've been to hurt me. Like a lot of people will default to that. Like, no, I didn't mean to hurt you. And sometimes you have an argument about that, right? Rather than about the thing that you're, that yeah, you're actually yeah. having a problem with. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a very, it, I'm sure we could talk a lot more about that <laughs> one specific thing. So, um, so what about, um, what about new partnerships and new things that are happening? Oh, yep, that's we have, one. we have, we have a, a puppy dog. <laughs> Love. <laughs> <laughs> um so what about the new relationships you're saying well no i said new partnerships so we have the we have a supporting yes, the our, uh, new partnerships uh but relationships are oh, sorry yeah partnerships are a little different because they have more of the agreements and about sort of major life things vacations families financial stuff scheduling how do you support your partnerships when they're in uh or new partnerships forming with your significant other how do you how do you Um, figure that out well that's huge i mean you have to have you have to talk you have to talk about the impacts that it's going to have in your partnership right so talking about partnerships as in like sharing something that is, is connective you know maybe that's buying a car maybe that's uh getting a bank account together. Maybe that's raising a child together. Maybe that's having a child with this person. Um, So with all of that, like, so you as an individual decided that you want to have a partnership with this other person, Uh but you also have a partnership with, with person A, right? We'll do A and B. So you have a partnership with person A, and now you want a partnership with person B. Let's say A, you live with A, you have a house with A, let's say you have a child with A, and you share all the finances with A. So B comes into the picture, and all of a sudden you want to um, have this person more integrated into your life. And and let's go extreme here. You want to have a child with B, Uh Um, a biological child you're also going to have to talk to your partner A. So your partner B and you decided that this is what you want to do and this is going to make you guys happy, Uh but you have A and you have a house and all these finances. So now maybe it's the three of you can have a conversation. Maybe it's setting expectations and boundaries and how this can work. Maybe A doesn't want B to live in the house. Maybe that is not an emotional safe place for A, and that's okay. Um, So does that mean we're going to get a townhouse then? Uh Or, you know, is that splitting time between um, as equal as possible? Um, Does that mean your partner A and you are going to have to reconfigure how you do your finances? Uh Uh-huh. Um, and how are they going to be allocated or talk about medical insurance mm-hmm. and all of these other things? Child care. Child care. <laughs> how do you schedule things if you need to schedule stuff, if people are work schedules and you add a new person to the mix and all that stuff? 
Jason, when you were speaking, I have to tell you, it reminded me so much of last summer in my life. It was almost like you were speaking about my situation. I know you were talking about a hypothetical. It's like, geez, I was in this, I was in this, in this predicament as well. So it's really interesting. I could talk about that after you're finished uh, going through that. But. I mean, I was just doing an extreme measure. Like, so there are small things too. Like it could simply be like, I'm going to open a bank account with somebody and, um, you know, the bank account is going to be used for vacations. And this is the partner that I choose to go on vacations with. Like it could be yeah. something smaller like that. It doesn't have to be the extreme child. Um, <laughs> yeah. But when you do em embark on a new uh, partnership and then there's these shared things, like your existing partnership has to be informed. That's going to affect them in some type of way. And it's not the relationship part that is being mm -hmm. affected. So it's not the emotional, it's not the intimacy. It's, it's not that part that's affected. It's, the daily living and how that was managed that is going well, to be interrupted that needs to be readdressed boundaries. Well, I think, so here, I'll offer this. Uh, so okay. I think that sometimes the relationship can be impacted too, especially yeah. if the partnership components that it pre-exists with, say, partner A, are affected by the new relationship, the, the relationship with partner B or yeah, person mm -hmm. B. Um, and if the partnership aspects and the things, the resp shared responsibilities are affected, that's going to affect uh, the emotional side of things. So responsible members of that structure will have those conversations. So the impacts are minimal. There's always gonna be feelings about stuff, but you don't want long-term impacts or resentment. Uh, building up you have to talk about those things so i think that you can have some residual side of like side effects from that but responsible people will make time to at least try to talk about these things yeah in a meaningful way um and and also to decisions about um, establishing new partnerships could have an impact like let me just give you an example so not everything in your example was uh, was speaking about what I want. So the kids thing wasn't even part of that. But um, so when when the woman I was with and I ended up breaking up, part of what she wanted was she wanted she wanted aspects of a partnership. She wanted to be able to explore these things. She knew she couldn't have those things with me. And I said, well, and I had already spoken with my wife about this. And I said, well, this is what I think is going on. And then she asked me a couple of really big questions, like, I'll just be transparent here. She asked me, well, do you want a divorce? I'm like, no. <laughs> Why would I? I'm like, holy shit, no, no. Um, do you want to separate and then go live with her? I'm like, no, that's not what I want. I have, I have things here that I want. I'm good with that. But however, I want to potentially meet the partnership needs of this other person what could that look like? So we discussed a few scenarios and then um, I brought them up in our breakup discussion <laughs> as it turned out. And they weren't, uh, I, this person, this woman did not know that I was feeling the, uh, that I was feeling so connected with her, but I think it was too late. She'd already sort of made a decision that this was, yeah. this was too, this wasn't going to work. So, um, so my wife was very supportive of me in this discussion about, the possibility of, of a partnership aspect. Um, didn't work out, that's okay. You know, life moves on, but you know, that's that's ideally what you want. You wanna be able to have honest conversations that, yes. um, and then be honest in your responses too. It's like, hmm, getting a divorce, that sounds like an interesting, I, no. <laughs> no. For some people that would work. And some people that maybe they wanna do that. Yeah. It's like, well, maybe I do want to do that. But for me, no, I, that, that mm -hmm. wasn't going to work for me. So, um, yeah, I've heard of uh, people who have gotten a divorce. So there's not a legal binding. So, but they, the partnerships, they all live together, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the divorce was to make more of an equality. Mm -hmm. um, and then everyone would share, like the finances mm -hmm. and the child 
rearing um, and everyone in this particular situation, everyone had separate finances as far as they had their separate bank accounts and they would pull all the money into for the bills into one, right? You know, they would split it all. You owe me X, Y, and Z for mm -hmm. these bills. Um, and that's the way it is, um, which is nice. Um, I heard of other partnerships where they have separate bedrooms and everyone sleeps in separate bedrooms. Um, so it's like inviting into that personal space. So that's like supporting other relationships too. So if you have um, someone come over and visit, like they're visiting your room and in your space um, and your other partnerships at that home will have their own place to go to. And so that's part of that too. Um, I know another thing that we talked about was schedules. Like uh -huh. how you can support each other in different partnerships or relationships and having schedules. Shared calendar. Google Calendar. <laughs> Google Calendar works too. Sure. Yep. Helps um, a lot. Um, and, one thing one thing that we do as I and that, that we'll get into some of this with the the boundaries and whatever and the setting expectations is but uh, one thing that I've done is I've had conversations about, okay, so look, if you're going, because I have a partnership with you, um, if you want to start, if you want to make plans with somebody else and those plans are going to impact um, my time either at home or, you know, influence how we support our children um, and say, for example, you want to go on a date and you need, and I've just, I just worked 48 hours in three days or something ridiculous. Like, actually, I don't even know if that's possible. Yeah, it is possible, but I'm just being extreme here. But uh, you want to go on a date, we need to talk about this before, because if there's childcare involved, it's like, okay, you're expecting me to look after the children and I'm exhausted or I'm sick. Yeah. So um, I want to support you and what you're doing, but you need to be considerate of what resources you're going to expect from me to to use in order to support your your adventure, whatever that looks like. So, um, so I think being clear about um, making sure that the you tell your partner you need to have the that, that you need to have at least a quick discussion. It's not that I, I find actually. If you do, have you ever come across this where where say maybe the your partner A's, the, the par partner B, who is not yours, but they're your meta, we'll explain about that, uh, but um, your partner's partner or relationship says, well, do you have to ask permission? Is it okay? <laughs> and it's like, I've had that from different people. It's like, no, it's not about permission. It's about respecting what I have established and there are certain responsibilities that I have in place. Absolutely. Here. Let me just check with them is not about getting permission because that um, my wife does not get to dictate to me the terms of how I choose to conduct my relationships, but I have to be mindful about how my choices are going to impact my partnership with my wife or in my relationship with my wife too, obviously. Um, so, I have to be aware of that and she has to know that I care about that too. And then the other person has to realize that, no, it's not about permission. It's about being considerate. Um, yeah, that's, I have gone through that. I'm going through that mm -hmm. where um, a person felt that I was dictating um, my partner's relationship with them, you know, um, little things. And, and it was strange, to me, it was strange things. It was the smallest little things. Mm -hmm. um, him and I had agreements that we had set and made, actually that he had set as he was adjusting into, mm -hmm. into this lifestyle. Um, and agreements are hard. A lot of times agreements do get broken um, because they can develop some restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about that later. But, um, but I had a, a meta of at, continuously ask my partner, like, well, is that okay? Can this happen? Can that happen? You know, um, if I come visit, can we go to the bar? Like, or is she going to throw a fit? Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm not throwing a fit, but I do have a child with my partner, um, a nine-month-old. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and 
being the caretaker is that mindfulness and being like, Hey, do you mind like being home with our son so I can go out with my relationship person? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Well, it's just a simple ask. It's a simple discussion. Or if mm -hmm. an agreement needs to be adjusted or agreement was broke, it comes back to mm -hmm. a discussion. Why was this broken? Does this need to be readjusted? Is this yeah. boundary um, or rule or whatever, um, is it non-existent anymore? Does it have to stay? Like, uh -huh. did we move past this safety net that we created? Um, is there a need? And it just comes to that communicating, like, uh -huh. in the health space. Um, but I also have been involved where people had thought that because I had a partnership, meant that I'm restricting them to be able to have an authentic relationship for how it should be. Um, and then I also had people tell me how I was feeling when some of those mm. agreements had been broken um, instead of listening to what I actually felt hurt over. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting. Um, just to segue or just a sideline on that, that sometimes uh, we can interpret how somebody's feeling without actually really asking them how they're feeling. And so yeah. I think if we make assumptions about how somebody's feeling about something, mm -hmm. especially when there's a rocky situation, <laughs> um, that, that's a recipe for trouble because then you're telling people how they feel or uh, <laughs> I've had my wife say to me, and she's right, she's right <laughs> about 80% of the time when I, when I actually do do this, is that are you deciding those feelings for me? Oh, oh, yeah. Are you deciding that for me? And, um, the, you know, that uh, I've, I try to be a lot more clear in how I speak about things. It's like, I see behaviors and this is what I'm thinking I'm seeing, but I don't know how you feel about it. Tell me about this. <laughs> That's That tends to be a little better than going, well, you just, you're mad at me because of blah, 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 or whatever, you know, I'm just hypothetical. But yeah, getting, having people tell you how you're feeling about, Something is not good. It's not conducive to supporting no. each other. Um, so I guess this can go into the segue of um, how you and your wife do the May I Share protocol. Can you oh, yes. can do we, that uh, with us? Uh, yes. So you know what I was thinking? Is since we've gone an hour on this particular podcast, I'm thinking what we should do is we should leave that for a part two. Yeah. And we'll do, do, that. We'll, do part two. we'll just continue this as a part two, but everybody yeah. else is listening has to wait for the for the other half but yeah we're going to be talking about uh <laughs> in the second part we're going to talk about communicating and different ways to communicate and how to support that uh talk about boundaries and what to do about broken boundaries and renegotiating things talk about jealousy uh and respect and honoring mm -hmm. yourself and that sort of thing so we're gonna we're gonna cover that in the part two but this will be a good way if you're if you're listening to this and you need to stop you only have an hour commitment right now. Uh, I know we've talked a lot, so this is good. <laughs> so we'll see you guys in the next episode. Okay, bye. Uh, please like, follow, and support us. Um, yeah, subscribe. We, yeah, we, we're, we're just two people talking. Yeah. yeah. If you would like us to talk about any certain topic or subject, um, please leave a comment. Yeah, yeah, leave a comment in the, this, in the uh, below the description. That'll really help. Yeah. Everyone have a great day. Bye. Bye.